Hello everyone and welcome to Meet the Experts Empowering Yourself on Your Science Journey. We are just waiting a couple minutes for folks to join and get connected, but we are so excited to talk to you all today and introduce you to our speaker, Marisa Vara. And while we're waiting for folks to join, we actually have, we wanna hear from you, we have a word cloud question for you about what are you passionate about? We wanna know what are you passionate about? Because we're gonna be talking a bit about different STEM careers uh, today, as well as how that connects to your passions. I think we're going to go ahead and get started today. So we today are going to be doing Meet the Experts, Empowering Yourself on Your Science Journey. And I'm Katie Wolfson with the UCAR Center for Science Education, and this is Meet the Experts. So we have folks joining today from all over the world. We have folks that are coming to us from here in Boulder, Colorado, where we are at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. We have folks that are connecting from Turkey, from India, from Tanzania, from Florida, from Louisiana, uh, Virginia, all over the country here in the US. So we are so excited to welcome you to Meet the Experts. For those of you who haven't seen it before or participated before, Meet the Experts is a monthly Q&A where we connect you to experts in the weather, climate, and earth science, earth sciences. And we are so excited to connect you with our expert today, Mari Savara. I'm gonna introduce her in just a moment, but before we do that, I also wanted to share that this month's Meet the Expert, as well as next week's Meet the Expert, are part of the worldwide teaching on climate and justice. And so we have, uh, today is actually the main event day for the worldwide teaching on climate and justice. There are events happening all over the world today and in the coming days. We have a second event happening next week on Wednesday, April 5th, that we invite you to come participate in as well, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the event organizers who have a quick welcome video uh, to welcome us all and bring us into that climb and teach an event. Welcome to the worldwide teaching on climate and justice. You are joining tens of thousands of students at hundreds of schools across the planet in learning and thinking about the work each of you can do now and in your future to repair the climate and lead a just transition to a clean energy future. Your worldwide teaching will mobilize the power of educators and students and empower a generation of fighting to stabilize the climate and advance climate and justice. We all need to get comfortable talking about climate all the time. The teaching helps us do that. The Worldwide Teach Team is a call to organize events on campus or community on or around March 29th, 2023. The key to successful teaching is relying on homegrown talent, not outside experts. We all need to step up. The biggest threat to your future is thinking that somehow someone else is going to stop global warming. This is the great work of our generation. We hope this teaching will help you find your own pathway to repairing the climate. All right, everyone. So this is just one of the events as part of that worldwide teach-in. Um, and today what we are going to be doing is we are going to be talking with Marisa Vara, who is a higher education specialist here at the UCAR Center for Science Education. Now throughout this presentation, I want to encourage you all to type to us in the chat or use the Q&A function in this webinar to ask your questions. And you can ask questions at any time based on anything you hear um, or see during the presentation uh, or anything you want to share in response to what we're talking about today. So this is going to be an interactive presentation. We'll have some questions for you um, and also time for questions from all of you. So please feel free to, if you haven't already, type in the chat to let us know where you're watching from today. We would love to say hello um, and know where everyone is joining us. So type that in the chat um, and then also feel free to answer any questions you have for us at any time during the presentation. Uh, there is also closed captioning available through Zoom too that you can turn on and off if you would like that. 
Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring on our speaker. Welcome, Marisa. Hi, thank you. <laughs> so Marisa is a higher education specialist here at the UCAR Center for Science Education. Um, she is a wonderful teammate of ours. And Marisa, can you tell us a bit more about what do you do as a higher education specialist? Yeah, so my job is to be um, helping the students, um, undergrads mostly, and that, that are historically marginalized um, communities, um, find their career path and help them guide them through their career path, give them advice, support them, mentor them, um, find good mentors for them, really just kind of help them grow in the person that they are and in the career in the STEM careers themselves. So you're kind of helping people find their path or empowering them on their path to their STEM careers. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's what I hope is that I get them figuring out what they're really passionate about, what they're really interested in, and then they connect all of the dots together and then hopefully they follow their, their passion and go on with their careers that way. And then another part of my position is um, really wanting to not only allow the students to find their career paths and get there, but I don't want them to go into an environment that maybe isn't the most welcoming for them. So a big portion of my career or my position is to really help the, the culture and the environment within the STEM fields um, to, to be more inclusive of all people. So um, it's a mix of both yeah, of those things. So you need both of those things, right? It's so important and especially creating that healthy environment. Um, for everyone going into those STEM fields. And so we're gonna get into that a bit more later, but we wanna turn it over to our audience now and find out, I know we have a variety of folks registered that are gonna be at different stages in their career path and in their science journeys. So we're curious to learn from you about what kind of job do you want to have or do you have right now? So what kind of work do you do? So is it connected to the STEM field or not? So we want to kind of know from you. So type that in the chat if you can share with us what kind of job do you want to have or what kind of job do you have now? And we're talking a bit about STEM careers, those science, technology, engineering, math, or those science jobs. Um, and so a lot of people might think about science jobs as just being a researcher or a scientist, right? Are there other types of jobs that might be STEM Absolutely, related? yes. I'm an educator, but I still consider myself a scientist. I still work in the science fields. I'm still very much a STEM professional. Um, but as an educator, I get to do a mix of using my science passion and what I'm interested in and helping those students in their, educated, in their education and their pathways. Um, so that's one example. I was a teacher before. I was a science teacher. That's still in the STEM field. Mm -hmm. um, you can also be a park ranger looking and, and guiding people through walking trails and things like that and learning about the ecosystems around. That's a STEM career. Yeah. There's a wide variety in the federal research labs, academia, mm -hmm. all sorts of different types of STEM jobs out there. So Yeah, and I think one thing, too, that I like, especially through this Meet the Exper Experts programs we get to do is we get to meet so many different types of jobs, right, that are related to the STEM fields, right? So here here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, we have aircraft mechanics, we have chefs, uh, we have lawyers, um, we have you know um, custodial staff, we have facilities maintenance. There are all sorts of jobs that are supporting STEM or working in STEM fields uh, that I think are so important and so powerful for us to remember. So let's see what we have from our audience here. Uh, we have a research administrator in STEM. Um, with a Spanish literature and Latin American studies background. We have PhD students focusing on marine carbon cycle. And in the future, they're hoping to work on marine carbon dioxide removal as a climate change solution. That's awesome. That's super awesome. That's awesome. Um, so um, thank you everybody for sharing that. Um, I wanna take a second to look back to our first question when we were all getting started about what are we passionate about? So let's go ahead and pull up that word cloud responses and let's see what some of our audiences are passionate about. Ooh, I like the helping my community. That's also something I'm very passionate about and I think my job suits that passion really well. Climate justice, accessible it. STEM education. I really like that too. I like to do things I'm seeing in here of uh, my kids and family, right? So mm -hmm. having those things that you're passionate about in your personal life and in your family and thinking about how those might connect to climate um, justice, climate action, to climate science, right. um, including everyone, accessible education, connecting people, human connection. So a lot of connections in here too, mm -hmm. I'm seeing. And so I think one thing we're gonna talk a little bit, Marisa's gonna share is a little bit about what she's learned about connecting what you're passionate about 
to your careers or what job you want to have in STEM. Or even if it's not a job in STEM, maybe it's a hobby in STEM. Maybe you're right. doing community science and citizen science and that kind of work as well. Um, and so science can be accessible for a lot in lots of different ways. There's right? multiple different ways to do science. Yeah. It's not just being in a research lab. Yeah. Um, so uh, with that, I'm actually going to step off camera, but Marisa, I'm curious. So we're talking a lot about like STEM and science and that kind of stuff. Were you always interested in science? Were you kind of a science kid? I was very up? much a science kid growing up, yeah. Um, so I grew up in a small town in Texas, um, Uvalde, Texas, with my beautiful family here that you can see. Um, and it, I grew up in the country, kind of. It was a big, huge amount of land that I could just go and explore and really be curious and really step into my curiosity. Um, so I would go and like crack open rocks or I would um, climb up a tree and look at the different types of leaves or like lay down on the grass and stare up into the clouds and see it moving and being like, oh wow, clouds move and the world churns and this is so interesting. And so I was very interested in the environment and the elements that were surrounding me. However, I always assumed um, that the only way I could do science was to be in some sort of biological field. Um, so I thought it would be like a health science or a animal kind of medical science field. So a veterinarian or a doctor were really the only two things that I thought were um, options for me um, as a kid. So I had no idea that there was an actual science out there for our system sciences and the environment and climate and things like that, even those were things I was passionate about, I thought I just had to be in the bi biological science to do them. Um, but it wasn't until I joined Geoforce, which is an outreach program in um, that focused on South Texas, rural South Texas and urban area of, of Texas. So the Houston area and then the San Antonio area where my hometown is at. Um, they recruited a whole bunch of students from lower income schools and kind of historically marginalized groups as well um, to really get them interested and started getting interested in the geosciences. So I got recruited my eighth grade year and started that summer in the program. It's a four year program. Um, so every summer we went to a different spot. So there are spots in the DC area, there are spots in the Grand Canyon area. Um, Florida was one of them and Oregon was one of them. Um, but it wasn't until the Oregon spot when I went to go visit Oregon that I was like hooked on it. Um, before it wasn't that it wasn't interesting. It was just like, I just assumed it was just rocks. Um, didn't realize the connections that earth sciences have with the environment and the climate um, until I went to Oregon. And then I saw the different types of environmental changes and climate changes going from the mountains and the volcanoes there to the coastline and that drastic change in climate between those two areas and then it clicked. Oh, I can do environmental climate change within the geosciences and I can have a career outside and be outdoors, which I love doing and really kind of invest in this. So I ended up going to undergrad because Geoforce is sponsored by the University of Texas at Austin, um, the Jackson School of Geosciences. So I ended up going there for my undergrad. Um, and I was very excited because I got in and it was my first choice and it was what I was thinking that I wanted to do. Um, but then I got kind of a um, reality check, I guess you could say. Um, I'm a first generation college student. Um, my parents didn't go to college. Um, so I struggled a lot in my first two years there. I didn't, um, I didn't have the I just I wasn't ha I didn't have the ter the college prep that maybe some other of my peers had. Um, I wasn't really great in the in the basics of the science and math. Um, I wasn't able to really fully understand those big lecture classes and, and trying to like understand what they were teaching me. I just ended up realizing I learned in a different way. I got through those most of the time. I went to a community college and took those classes at a community college. But once I got through those basics and I kind of got into the geoscience classes a little bit more, I thrived and I was like connecting all the dots and it made sense what they were talking to me about in chemistry finally. And like it all just started connecting. And it wasn't until like probably my third year in college that I was like, oh, okay, I'm learning a little bit differently than maybe my peers were learning. And I see more things in a big picture kind of sense. And the little details need to connect to the big picture for my brain to understand it. Um, and having more like hands-on related things. So all the labs I did great on, things like that. So um, 
it was really interesting to realize that I just wasn't a typical learner in undergrad. And it was a, an adventure. I ended up taking five years instead of the traditional four years um, just to really understand everything. And then I wanted to get my grades back up and then kind of graduate and move forward with that. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, I think that's a that's a common story I think we hear, right? It's a very different environment in high school than it is going into undergrad. Um, and there's a lot of learning that you do about yourself um, and about the rest of the world in college that maybe is going to be a different environment than in high school. And so were there any particular things that you learned about yourself or, or maybe ways or resources that you learned those things about yourself um, that might be helpful to other folks who are navigating that? Yeah, so I um, I mentioned that hands-on stuff was really important to me. So doing the la the la the labs was a good way for me to understand the material that I was learning. Um, one of my experiences was a field experience. Um, if you see there, um, I'm on a boat um, swiping off some some mud of a collection that we collected for a field campaign that I our field camp that I was on. Um, there, my um, the group that I was in ended up being like a whole bunch of different little groups that worked as a team to solve a big problem. And it made just complete sense. I like thrived in that environment. I was like, oh, I'm a team worker. I know how to like, I know what my part is. I can make sure that I can get that accomplished. And then I can see how that fits in with the bigger pictures. And I just got really excited and really invested in the fact that like this was how I learned, you know? And so it was just really just like, oh, I'm, I can do this career. I can be a good scientist in this field. And it, it's, I just need to do it with an environment that is more of a team environment and a collaborative environment. That's kind of where I thrive at personally. So um, it was just learning those things about myself that, oh, okay, you're great at this. You're not, you're not a bad scientist, but you, um, you need to have a different type of environment to really help you and support you in this career. And do you feel like you had some folks that could support you in undergrad um, to kind of navigate that or find those things out about yourself too? Or do, were you kind of figuring that out a lot on your own? It was a little bit of a mixture, really. Um, I had a really hard time asking for help in undergrad. Um, I thought that me asking for help would be a weakness. Um, it would be kind of like a I can, if I ask for help, that means I can't do this. That means I'm not cut out for this. I had that mindset for some reason in my head, that huge amount of imposter syndrome going through undergrad. Um, and so I had a really hard time asking for help. So a lot of it was me persevering, like you can just keep going, you'll keep going, it'll happen, it'll work. You just keep working hard and you'll get there. But then it was a realization like, I can't do this on my own. There's no way I can do this on my own. My parents are great and wonderful supporters, but they don't know this experience either being again, a first generation. So it was really tapping into my mentors from Geoforce um, that I had there that really kind of helped me understand that like, okay, you need to learn how to work in a college atmosphere. Like here's a little bit more on that college prep kind of mindset of things. Um, so it was really finding the mentors and the support system within that um, environment that helped me be like, okay, I can, I can trust these people to ask for help and that they won't judge me, that I'm not capable of doing any of this work. And then on top of it, I can, I can kind of grow myself in that way. Yes, I'm still pretty stubborn in that sense where I am pretty resilient and push through a lot of things that I probably should ask for more help for, but um, realizing that asking for help is totally okay and it's totally totally a reasonable thing to do and it does not mean you're not good at whatever you're doing yeah i think it's a lesson that a lot of us can can remind ourselves of right of that there are people around us who can help if we reach out or especially in like climate science and in the climate movement right like it takes all of us working together on teams which you realize you need to you know thrive in and you know learning from each other and asking for help is kind of how we're gonna move through this climate movement, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So what, so, so you learn a lot of things about kind of yourself and you learn and how you thrive in undergrad. Um, and from that point, like, what did you think you wanted to do next after your undergrad degree? I had no idea. <laughs> um, I, grad school was always in the back of my head. It was always something that I thought I would do, but I just, I wasn't sure if I fully wanted to commit to 
to doing that. I did undergrad research. I really enjoyed it, but I just didn't know if I wanted to continue on into grad school. Um, so I ended up getting an internship at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality there in Texas. Um, it was working for the environmental agency there. So I was in the remedial area um, and I was working there all summer long. And then I got an opportunity to go on a research um, vessel in Antarctica or in the Scotia Sea. So I said yes to that. So I kind of was just like, I don't really know what I want to do, but I'm going to explore every option. So I, I stayed in the environmental sector because I was like, well, I do want to do something that seems um, like I'm making a difference, right? So I've always been invested in the climate. I've always wanted to help the earth and the world be a better place. So I've always wanted to do something climate related. So I thought the environmental sector was the best place for me. Um, personally, my school is a big um, oil and gas school. So I was like, I don't think I want to do oil and gas. It doesn't seem like it fits kind of my personal core values and morals. So I went to the environmental sector thinking that I would help in that aspect of being in the remedial area and helping clean out the earth kind of thing. Um, and then I learned I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like re necessarily being a regulator. I felt like I wasn't really making that big of an impact that I thought I did. And then having that research experience that I had, I was like, I really do still love research, really do still love that kind of aspect of understanding a problem and going kind of really deep into it and really trying to figure out a solution about it. Um, all my research was in paleoclimate. So I did, which is study of past climates. Um, so I did a lot of research on understanding past climates and how that could help with this current climate that we're in. Um, so after staying at TCQ for two years, I was like, okay, I tried it. Environmental sector is not for me personally. Um, and I think I should go back to grad school. So I ended up going back to grad school. Gotcha. And um, what did you go, what was your kind of goal going back to grad school? What were you studying? Like, what did you want to do with the degree? Yeah, so I still continue doing paleoclimate research. Um, and I studied corals, um, actually, in the um, Ver in Veracruz, Mexico, which is um, off the Gulf of, well, Gulf of Mexico. So my research advisor in that group was all very much in the Gulf of Mexico region. Um, my research was more about kind of so corals are a proxy, a climate proxy that helps you kind of determine what the climate was back in time because they're so sensitive to the environment that they're in. Um, they're really good climate tracers. Um, so I did geochemistry, which surprisingly I struggled in chemistry in undergrad so much. I ended up doing it as a research because again, once it clicked, it clicked. Um, so I used geochemistry on my corals to understand some trace elements and some oxygen isotopes and things like that to really understand the sea surface temperatures for when they were alive um, and helped kind of put together, reconstruct is what we call it, a climate of that area um, to determine what the climate was and then see the differences from there to today and what differences there were, and what maybe environmental impacts have affected the climate from then to now kind of situation. Kind of climate detective. Looking yeah, at it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I loved it. I thought it was great. It was wonderful research. Um, I really enjoyed that aspect of things. Um, and I like knowing about these things and kind of push it, putting things together, kind of like an investigator, like you said. Um, but unfortunately, the environment in grad school just wasn't um, supportive for me. Again, I really thrive on that team and collaborative kind of environment. My advisor was not the best match for me mentor wise, um, mentor mentee wise. We just didn't um, see eye to eye in that situation. And then I had some really difficult um, problems with the environment that I was in. Um, it just I was one of the few. And I'm sure lots of people have heard somebody say something like that it was one of the few in that environment. I was um, I just didn't feel like I had support, not necessarily from my peers. There was a certain some peers that just weren't supportive, but there were a group that were supportive. But the general um, support and supporting of my professors, the people that you thought would be would understand the struggles that you were going through, especially as a woman, I had a woman advisor, like having that kind of perspective of like, oh, you went through this, so you should know kind of thing. And then wondering, realizing that it wasn't the right thing that they went through kind of situation. Um, so I know I'm beating around the bush. I had a lot of um, unfortunately racist kind of remarks and microaggressions and um, it really affected my mental health at that time. And I was just not 
able to, I, I realized that 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 pathway just wasn't the right pathway for my academic trajectory. And I was just like, I don't think I can do this anymore. And then I kind of started volunteering more with like outreach groups and under and like working with more of this local student programs and stuff like that and getting involved in helping education and outreach aspects of things. And I was like, I really enjoy doing this. This makes me happy. It's not like research did make me happy, but that environment made me so exhausted that I was like, this in general is not making me happy. I want to go and like be an, an educator, education and really kind of tap into that kind of aspect of of what I've always was passionate about because of Geoforce, because of all these experiences I've had before this time, mm -hmm. um, that I was just like, I don't think that academia is for me. I don't think that it's for my mental health. I don't think it's something that I want to continue doing forward in that aspect. I do want to help people in academia so that doesn't happen to them, but I don't think I want to be in that place anymore. Yeah, so it's so, I, and I'm, I'm so sorry that you had that experience. and. I think it's an experience that unfortunately happens a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's such a powerful thing for you to realize uh, that there are different ways you can follow your passions, right? You discovered this new passion in education and outreach. And also you took what you learned, as unfortunate as it was in grad school, and it sounds like you turned that into this amazing career that you have now. Right. Yeah. So what 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 was that like? Kind of what were those steps that brought what brought you here to NCAR as a higher education specialist? Yeah. So I after grad school, I um, Geoforce called. We, we, I was always in contact with Geoforce. Geoforce is um, kind of what I would imagine people who are um, alumni to other outreach other programs like that they're always going to be supportive of those of those students. Um, so they've always been supportive of me. So they were like, oh, you want to do education outreach? Come behind the scenes, learn about the logistics with us, spend a summer with us and hang out with us all summer long. So I did that all summer long. I was so thankful. It gave me kind of an opportunity to leave an environment that wasn't good for me. And I got another kind of way of of exploring a new career path that I wasn't, that I was like, oh, this is something I can do kind of thing. Um, and then after that, I ended up teaching at my local high school for a little while. Um, I taught high school science there, environmental science actually. So like trying to learn how to communicate science in a way with people that aren't, I've always communicated science with people who are passionate about science, but communicating about science with a whole bunch of high schoolers who honestly just want to graduate and get out of there kind of situation was a different way of communicating because it was trying to relate more to them than than maybe somebody who was already really interested in science kind of situation. So I learned a different communication style, but then I also unfortunately learned the inequalities of edu the education system um, and how maybe it's not... Um, very equitable along all different types of groups and all different, even within the organization, my environmental science class was um, not a pre-AP class, right? So all the pre-AP students were, were a different way, different type than the students that I had. And it wasn't that it was bad, it was just that they needed to be taught in a different way. And I related to that because I needed to be taught in a different way. Um, so it was just kind of like learning different learning behaviors and learning styles and really kind of just being embraced in all of that and kind of forced to learn that aspect of, of your way of communicating kind of situation. And then I got a job at the National Science Foundation um, after my teaching position. And I learned that um, my perspectives that I had from undergrad and my teaching perspectives and my working in the, in the education space space so far um, really was in a, was a was a pro working at, at the National Science Foundation because they were looking for somebody to provide these kind of perspectives. They were talking about it, but they didn't really have somebody who went through it kind of situation. Um, so I provided that perspective and I kind of worked on there and I learned that I could um, blend my education and science passion in with the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives that they were trying to move forward in that space. And I ended up just kind of blending those two together and just working in that space. And um, I ended up getting recruited from there to NCAR UCAR working for the SOARS program, which is Significant Opportunities for Atmospheric Research and Sciences. Um, 
here at UCAR. So I do that program um, as well as I go on talks in different organizations to different scientific conferences and things like that, talking about DEI related work and um, initiatives and really kind of moving forward in that space too, within not only our organization, but the community as a whole, the scientific community as a whole. Um, so that's what I, that's what got me here so far. And I really enjoy it. I love doing what I do, it's really, it's igniting all of my passions into one and I kind of fell into this career path, but I, I think now looking back, I would have always gone here. Like, I don't think, I think I, all my pathways, whichever one I would have took would have always le like led me to where I'm at right now. And you kind of started with like um, <clears throat> realizing with geosciences and connecting it to climate and you know doing paleoclimate research and wanting to kind of change the world and help the world through climate science do you feel like you get to do that in your role now yeah so originally i wanted to be a professor and kind of have my own research group and do climate research and help students with that aspect of things um and while I don't have my own research lab and I'm not doing climate research per se. I do think that I'm helping students understand how to bridge those connections together because most of the students who come have to have, um, they have a STEM background or STEM interests of some sort. And then um, we do atmospheric science research here at this organization. So they like to connect whatever they're passionate about in the STEM fields to the atmospheric research realm. And then they can see those connections and that's, what I think the beauty of is earth system sciences and climate in general is that it's not just one space, not one, um, yeah, space, uh, one sphere of the, of the earth system that is impacted. It's the geosphere, the hydrosphere, the um, atmosphere, all of them are connected with each other and interact with each other. And I get to help students understand that aspect of things. And they start connecting things to not only just the atmospheric sciences, but the societal impacts, the human impacts, and, and how they can maybe make a difference within their own community and bring that back to their own space and their own place and understand how to really make those things move forward. And I have a part in that. And if seeing them like light up with the passion that they have for for their research and their science is just really an amazing part of my job and it's really rewarding so um i love that i get to help them with that and then i get to help train the next generation of scientists to to do this work like that video said earlier this is this is for the generation of science to really make those climate impacts and those climate solutions that we're all hoping for and what what's the what's the power that you see in making STEM and making climate science more accessible, more welcoming to individuals from historically marginalized communities, right? Yeah, yeah. So in, in general, most of the climate, almost of the people who are impacted by climate change and the, the really severe climate events are historically marginalized groups. And if we can get their perspectives, they are doing this, they probably were born into these situations, so they see this every day. Their perspectives are way beyond what a scientist who's been studying it for eight years has, because they've been doing it their whole lives, right? So I think bringing in their perspectives, bringing in what they can offer from their community and their space, and really giving them that space and a voice to to do that science, to do that study, like we should just stand out of their way. Why are we creating all these barriers and these things to make them not feel welcomed in this field? Like we should lessen those barriers. We should let them do that. I bet you we would solve this solution a long time ago if it was more inclusive a while back, but that's my personal perspective. Um, I think it's, it's, it's important to have those perspectives. It's important to have that mindset and it's truly just the right thing to do. Like there, why are we being elitist and not allowing everybody into a, a field that is impacting the entire world, it impacts every person. Yeah, we're all a part of that. So exactly. Great, so we should all be working. <laughs> we should all be working on that yeah. together. Yes. Well, let's see if we have some questions from the audience now. I have a few more questions for you, Marisa, but I want to make sure if we have some questions here um, to feel free to type those in the chat or type those in the Q&A if you have questions for Marisa uh, before we um, wrap up today. So feel free to start typing those in. Um, Marisa, I'm wondering if you can share with me, you give, um, you help students on their path, mm -hmm. right? And so do you have any kind of go-to advice or general tips for any students who are watching today and participating today? Yeah, um, trust your gut. 
trust your instincts. Um, if there's something that just doesn't feel right wherever you're working at, if it doesn't seem like it's the best environment for you and you have a way to move forward, then try to get out of it as much as if you, if you can. I know that it can be difficult in some circumstances and it's not the easiest. Um, so I'm not saying that it's definitely something that everyone can do kind of situation. But for instance, my example of grad school, I could have continued on doing research that summer and might come maybe going to a PhD. Um, but I had an out with my GeoForce colleagues who were like, if you want to do this, let's do this kind of thing. So I took my out and it's landed me here so far. So I think it's possible. Um, it doesn't always work out. I'm not saying that it's a thing, but you know yourself better than anybody. So if it's not something that's healthy for yourself, then you should probably second guess and, and take a step back and really reevaluate the situation. Mm -hmm. And if it's a, a place that maybe you can leave, then I would recommend it. Yeah, I know there was a, a comment on the um, in the passion question we asked fo folks about of self care, right? So especially in climate work, where it can feel overwhelming or exhausting, um, that having taking that time or making sure that you center yourself and giving yourself the space and the energy and the care and create being in a safe and passion and a joy filled environment mm -hmm. where you can do that work is going to be so important. Yes, exactly. Yes. Always take care of yourself. Your mental health is so important. You can't save the world if you yourself are not feeling like you are um, stable in that that space. Um, how about, um, I'm curious um, if you have any advice. You said the other piece, right? The other part, it's not just all on the students, right? To do right. This. Maybe even more so, it's on the institutions and the organizations and the schools to create a welcoming environment. Um, what tips, um, since you do this work every day, what kind of tips and advice do you have for um, professors, for schools, for organizations, for bosses, for teachers to create that welcoming environment? Right. Yes, I 100 percent. It's not on the students. This is not something that they they shouldn't have to have to figure this all out on their own. They they should have an environment that allows them to do that. And my first thing would be to just be kind to each other. But that's easier said than done, especially when people don't realize that they're not being kind. Um, so setting those expectations in organizations and institutions of of what they expect their students to do or what they expect their faculty to be like with students, um, creating those environments with um, agreements, community agreements kind of situations. Um, but then having accountability for those agreements. So if somebody doesn't follow through, if somebody isn't following those agreements, then maybe um, what work, what's gonna be the action to make sure that they are accountable for that situation. So it's a mix of things, right? So it's being kind and just being human because everybody's human, everybody goes through struggles and just realizing that kind of aspect of things, but then on top of it really sticking to those those community agreements that you make with your group and understanding that it's if you're going to do this then you're going to have to kind of make everybody accountable not just the students mm -hmm. which is just definitely not just a student situation um, but faculty leadership all sorts of different types of people need to do that so mm -hmm. Yeah, so approaching it from that kind of systemic change and collective action approach too, right? So we can create an environment where students don't have to right. advocate or protect themselves, right? And that yes. they just feel like they can belong and they can bring their whole identities, their perspectives, their unique perspectives into this. Exactly. So that we can do the work and people can follow their passions wherever that leads them. Yes, exactly yeah. that. Like it's, it's not, it should not definitely be on the students. It should be a a whole system working together to really make it a better and inclusive environment. Yeah. Uh, so I, oh, we have a question here. Um, uh, we have a question of what is your one advice for next generation on how to be, how to be less impact on our earth and actions to take now? So do you have any thoughts on like for the next generation, what are actions that they can take to make less of an impact on our earth and um, take action now? Yeah, um, I would say, hmm, that's a good question. One, two, it would be um, just kind of understanding what your what you can control, right? So a lot of the a lot of the impacts that are happening in our in our system right now, our climate, our system 
our space, our, our science system, sorry. Um, a lot of the problems or things that are happening here are not necessarily something that one individual can do, but you can do what you can within the or within yourself, right? Um, so it would be um, working on like recycling and doing things like that. Yes, those are important. And I think those are things that people are doing now, but being mindful of those things early on, I think it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And like understanding that um, that this is our space and just like loving and trusting the world that we're in, like it's Mother Earth. So mm -hmm. kind of give it the love that you would your mother kind of situation or your family member or somebody that you really love and care mm -hmm. for. So as long as you love it the way that that is happening, then I think it will be OK. But the real problem is probably more of those kind of big companies and mm -hmm. industry kind of people who which in that sense, getting into policy, doing science policy is a good way of doing things, you know, not just staying in the research realm mm -hmm. of things, but really combining that research space with policy or with education and educating the new younger generations and really connecting science to the different aspects of things um, would be a good way to kind of influence that in the, in the space. Also, being able to talk in a related, relative way, mm, not trying to, piece, yeah, that communication yeah. Piece, piece is really important. I've, I've been in conversations with, with people, congressmen and other types of people in my previous work, um, where if I discussed climate change in a way that was um, understandable to them, like, okay, what's happening in your actual mm -hmm. space right now, your environment, your community, and they're talking about um, their cattle not being able to walk on the on their grassland in the winter time because of the winter isn't being frozen, like the grass isn't being frozen over. Mm -hmm. um, so they're getting stuck in mud and not really having like a good environment. I was like, well, that's climate change. That's what that is. So yeah. let's figure out how to like make that solution. Like wouldn't you want a solution because your cattle is really important to you mm -hmm. kind of so thing. So finding those values and connecting over values exactly. and, and local relatable impacts and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would add too, like, since we're talking about careers and things like that, remembering that um, that not one person, I think you said this, like not one person is going to fix everything. Right. Right. And not one of us individually can fix everything. But every job, no matter if it's a STEM job or a job in the arts, um, which are so important for climate communication, um, but every job can be a climate job. Right? right. So whatever job you are, or whatever you're passionate about, again, following those passions or hobbies or things like that, think about how that job or that passion connects to climate change and what are actions that you can take there or policies you can advocate for from those positions or from those different social justice movements that you're involved with or things like that. Because climate, as you're saying, Earth systems, like we're all part of it. We're all it's connected. all interconnected. It's all connected. Yes. So there are things there. Um, to explore and little actions that we can all take. And if all of us are taking actions in all the places where we are, that's where we can start moving. Yes, change, exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Um, well, we are actually about at the end of our time. Um, I don't see another question in here just yet. I think we um, feel free if you would like to um, reach out to us with more questions from Marisa. Um, you'll get a follow up email tomorrow that will have her email address um, that you can reach out with more questions. Also, um, if folks are interested in getting involved with the SOARS program, how could they find out more about that, Marisa? Yeah, so our website, soars.ucar.edu, um, will have all of that information there. Um, our applications for this summer is closed, but we're open around the November, December timeframe um, for new applicants. And then it, it closes the deadline is usually in the first week of February. So um, we're always looking for awesome potential protégés is what we call them. Um, so if you're interested in the SOARS program at all, please contact me or my colleague, Kadia Tierro. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marisa, for talking to us today. Thank you, everybody, for joining us um, from all over. I want to invite all of you to join us next week for our next Meet the Experts, which is also part of the Climate Teach-In. So next week, we have Meet the Experts Youth Action for Collective Climate Justice on April 5th. We have an 11 a.m. Mountain Time as well as a 6 p.m. Mountain Time, where we'll be talking to three different youth voices in the climate justice movement. So we would love to have you come and join us for that. You can sign up for that on our website here, and the link is in the chat as well. Uh, but with that, we are at the end of our time. Marisa, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much, everybody, and we will see you next time.
See you next week. Bye. Bye.